Um, the ETF, ETF debate, obviously, here in the US polarizes people. The SEC denied VanEck's Eck's um, uh, spot-based ETF, but obviously has allowed futures-based ETF. Now, uh, people that understand the, uh, the apparatus that sort of are involved with the spot markets through to futures market, through to you know, marketplaces like that, <laughs> it's, it's somewhat questionable, actually, isn't it? So, so Chris, let's, let's just unpack this. And why was one allowed and not the other first? Um, and what has it meant for actual consumers of this? Of this uh, yeah, product? so I think to start kind of with the, the second piece, why, why is this important? Why, why do uh, investors care about a futures-based ETF versus a physical-based ETF, right? So at a high level, um, futures-based ETFs, like for Bitcoin, the f Bitcoin futures, the CME Bitcoin futures trade at a premium to the underlying spot market. It's called contango with, with futures. Essentially what that means in simple terms is on a uh, annualized basis, the ETF itself has to roll contracts every month. They buy the front month contract, the next month they have to roll that to the next month's contract. And because those contracts trade at a premium, essentially what you get over the course of a year is underperformance of an ETF-based vehicle backed by futures relative to the price and performance of the underlier physical Bitcoin itself. So over the course of a year, that underperformance could be in the range of five to 15%, potentially even higher at times, depending on how large those premiums are. So for long-term investors, a futures-based ETF is not really the best um, uh, vehicle because you're going to have that erosion of the performance. And that's why the space has been advocating for a physically backed ETF for a long time. So that's why it's important. In terms of why a futures-based ETF has been approved and a physical ETF has not been approved, this has really culminated just recently, obviously, with a lot of the comments from Chair Gensler and the approval of, Van e um, of, of some of the futures-based, you know, ProShares and VanEck futures-based ETFs. A lot of those comments were around, you know, there's additional investor protections around, you know, a 40 Act vehicle that is, uh, that it has an underlier of futures that are directly regulated and overseen by the CFTC. Yeah. So I think that's given some comfort to the SEC. But conversely, you know, I think it's been confusing for a lot of folks in the space because the price discovery process where the market manipulation concerns that the SEC has continued to highlight for the underlier, um, the, the, the price discovery process uh, is influenced on the futures, obviously, by the spot markets, which is where the SEC has cited many times that there's market manipulation concerns and a lack of regulatory oversight of those exchanges. So it, it can be difficult to, to come to grips with the approval of a futures-based ETF that is priced directly based on physical Bitcoin um, when, when those markets are, are, are regulated. And so I think we've seen that actually culminate just yesterday or the day before um, Grayscale, which is the largest digital asset manager in the world, uh, you know, filed a letter with the SEC basically saying that if their, if their ETF gets denied, their physical backed ETF gets denied, they have plans to, you know, take legal action. And the, the reasons that they cited, there were a variety of them, but first and foremost was if one of the main reasons that the SEC has cited for not approving a physically backed ETF was the lack of a uh, regulated market of substantial size. Right. It's been very unclear what that size is, but the, the, SEC, uh, the CFTC uh, CME Bitcoin futures um, are a substantial size. It's just potentially not enough to meet that requirement of the SEC. And so it's, it's a little confusing to approve a futures-based ETF yeah. when then you're citing that as a reason uh, that, that it's not a significant size. Uh, yeah, and I, I, th I think Gary also referenced this point. He, he worried about, obviously, he couldn't police the entire globe's trading of digital assets, but he could police the U.S. Uh, market. Now, CME is obviously contained within the, within the U.S., so he's saying, well, I can regulate that. I think that's a transparent, fair market, and therefore any products that reference that yep. are going to be fine. But the, the reality of the matter is, is that the settlement price of the CME contract is actually derived by uh, spot exchanges, which, of course, are a function of global volumes. Right. Um, so, so that's the problem. That's the, that, that's the, that's the thing that we're grappling with. Uh, Ophelia, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I, th I think part of the issue you're running into here is that Fundamentally, futures-based products are made for a different group of people. Right. And I think that's something that we, the ETF industry is not always 
transparent to people outside of it. Like unless you happen to be dealing with these products, you might you might not be aware, right? It, it, the issues with these futures rules is not dissimilar from what you would see in a leveraged ETF. And those exist and, and they have a market for them and they're typically used by people who are actively trading. And yeah, that's short who term, they're made short for. Short-term traders. Absolutely. Yep. And so there's there's a reason for these products to exist. And I think there's been a narrative that like there's no logic for this at all. And, and there absolutely is. There's a group of people for whom this is a perfectly appropriate product. They should absolutely be in it. They should absolutely buy it. It does what they're looking for, where they want that exposure to those futures for whatever reason that is, and they're looking to, you know, either trade short-term volatility and, and they're running a specific strategy. And there are people for whom that is a great thing. Um, it's one of the reasons why, if you look at the size of those products and how they've grown, you're starting to see what the actual market size for those types of issues, those types of products are, and it's consistent with what you would expect of like a gold futures product versus gold or any other market where you have that type of instrument. And most commodities markets do. You mm. also have futures backed products and they, they do have a market. And I think it's super important to highlight that these products do have a reason to exist. However, I agree with you completely. They're really not meant for everybody and they're not one size fits all and they are expensive. And so they're, you need to be looking for that exposure in a very specific way if that's what you're going for. Right. And we both obviously built spot products. So we <laughs> have a yeah. house view on this, but I think it's just a different, it's a fundamentally different market. And I think that's a really important thing to remember when we talk about these products because it's absolutely true. They, they do reference spot, they, they are exposed to fluctuations in the underlying, and fundamentally they target a different group of people. So when you think about like whether we're actually meeting the brief in the US of providing that exposure in a regulated wrapper, the answer right now is no, no. we're providing something different right. and that different doesn't necessarily mean shouldn't, isn't a thing or shouldn't be a thing or is, a, you know, is wrong for everybody, but it's, it's not necessarily the most appropriate product to fit sort of the box I think a lot of people hoped it would. It's yeah. really for a different use case. Yeah, no, th thank you. Yeah, I think one thing last to add, I, I think on the road to that physically backed ETF um, that is for that long-term holder, to Ophelia's point, right, there's not really that perfect vehicle in no. the U.S. today. No. You've had closed-end OTC-traded products that traded premiums and discounts. You now have a futures-based product. So in light of the investor protections, I think sometimes it gets missed a little bit that um, having a regulated product, like we've seen in other jurisdictions in Europe and in Canada and others, that is a real value add and does add a lot of investor yeah. protections, right? right? And so I think this letter that was submitted is a, is a big step on the road to that happening. Similar to what happened in Canada, many people don't know the story, but 3IQ actually went through a very, very similar process back in 2019 filing for the first exchange traded Bitcoin product, which was denied and that process, that ruling had to be challenged in order to... It's a fairly strongly worded letter, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that had to be challenged in order to, to win that battle and get the product approved. So I think whether or not um, they win and the product gets approved, the, this process will provide some clarity yeah. as to what the indi what the, the metrics and thresholds need to be yeah. in order for the SEC to get comfortable approving, which I don't I think agree. we've had that transparency up until now. And also hopefully put some of the requirements the SEC has set up in context, because right now we're applying standards, like an undefined standard that I, I would question whether you know gold when that was issued or bronze or platinum or any of the precious metals when those products started coming to market. I, I don't know that the, if you look at the history of trading in similarly structured global markets based on commodity style, yeah. style products, we haven't needed to meet those same levels of right. requirements. So what are, those, what are those requirements? And what I does think that actually that mean? This process will help shed light on what those are because the standards are absolutely different here. Yeah, I, and look, I, people want to protect the investors, but if investors really want exposure to something, they'll get it. And so it might push them out in, further out into the risk spectrum, which is obviously not what the regulators want. Their primary mandate is to protect investors. <laughs>